All right. So if uh, everybody's here for multi-site versus domain, you're in the right spot. Uh, if you're not here for that, I guarantee you'll probably learn something and be wildly entertained. So before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about how this talk came to be. Uh, this past year, I was at Nerd Summit, which is a uh, camp in Western Massachusetts. And I was talking to a gentleman by the name of Shane Thomas. Uh, if you've been on Code Karate, he's the founder and uh, he runs, runs that site. Uh, we were talking about how people use or misuse uh, multi-sites. And uh, we were talking about this project that he was working on and whether it was like really, in really necessary to use a multi-site. And it got me thinking about a project that I was working on where we had a multi-site and we decided that we weren't going to go that way for the next iteration. And this is the story of, of that project. So let's get started. Uh, first, a little bit about me. My name is John Picozzi. I'm the senior Drupal architect at a uh, province-based company called Oomph. Uh, I'm also the co-organizer of the New England Drupal Camp, uh, co-podcast from Talking Drupal podcast and co-organizer of the Drupal Providence Meetup. Uh, I'm also an Acquia certified site builder, uh, lover of travel, and uh, I, as you can tell, like to eat sometimes. Yeah. So a little bit about Oomph. Oomph's a full service web agency headquartered in Providence, Rhode Island, with employees all over the United States. Actually, in the last two weeks, we've added uh, four new employees. Um, that are all remote. So that's pretty exciting. Um, at least I'm excited about that. Uh, we help companies with digital strategy, user experience, and of course Drupal implementations. Some of our clients include Blue Cross Blue Shield, Rhode Island School of Design, Brown University, NBC Sports, and as you'll hear about today, Leica Geosystems. A lot of our Drupal work revolves around uh, complex, impl in, uh, complex integrations commerce, uh, multilingual, and accessibility. And of course, we're hiring. So if you're in the market for a new job, check out our website, apply, we'd love to talk to you. All right, enough about me and what I do. Let's talk about a little bit of an overview of the project. So Leica Geosystems. Um, first off, who knows Leica cameras? Okay, a few people, cool. Uh, who knows Leica Geosystems? Uh, just for the recording, nobody raised their hand. Um, well, we're the latter. We're talking about the Geosystems branch of the company, which is pretty cool, actually. They make lasers. Who doesn't love lasers, right? Um, they got their start in surveying equipment. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then they created a laser distance meter, um, or their first laser distance meter, in 1993. Um, now they have the BLK3D, which is a uh, 3D reality capture uh, device. Um, and they just released that, uh, I believe it was a couple of years ago. So you may not know Leica Geosystems, but um, you've, you've probably heard about them in, in the news recently uh, with the tragedy at Notre Dame Cathedral. Well, turns out in 2010, uh, Andrew Talon, uh, architectural history professor at Vassar College, captured the entire structure of Notre Dame with a Leica Geosystems laser scanner. Those captures are actually being used and helping in the restoration rebuilding effort. So you may not have heard of the Leica Geosystems name until today, uh, but you're definitely aware of, of some of their work out in the real world. All right, so that's about Leica. Let's dive into the actual project and some of the, some of the background here. First things first, the Leica, Ge Leica Geosystems website is a, well, Leica is a global brand. The website has to serve everybody on the world, in the world. So right off the bat, we service nine countries uh, with this website. And then uh, we also have, uh, out of those nine countries, we have an India, India site and then a global um, a global site that serves all the other countries that we haven't started servicing yet. So keep in mind in the Drupal 7 instance of this site, um, 
each of these each of these countries has kind of their own path path structure. And we'll talk more about that uh, later, um, and then also country specific domain handling, how we deal with that. But you can see the list of uh, list of countries here: U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Australia, Japan. As I said, not listed here. India and a global site. So we're covering a lot of ground. The other aspect here is we're translating the site into uh, six languages right now, um, but could be more in the future, right? So we're, we're ever growing. Uh, English, English and French for Canada, uh, and then German, Italian, Spanish, and Japanese. So now you're starting to understand a little bit of the complexity here. Nine plus countries, we're going to actually be bringing on uh, a handful of countries within the next year. Um, so that's a growing, growing number, plus we're working with six languages. Again, that number is going to be getting bigger. Well, to add on top of that, because that wasn't complex enough, we decided to integrate with a bunch of third-party services. So uh, Quivers, they're using Quivers uh, for their um, fulfillment. Uh, and yes, yep, you got it. This is a commerce site as well. Uh, we're using Google Analytics, Hotjar, Mandrel, uh, Pardot, Lingotech, uh, Omnisar for affiliate tracking. So there are a lot of third-party things under the hood here uh, that, are, that are making this site a success. And then we'll end with a brief history here. So uh, I like to say that Leica's had two and a half websites. I've been lucky enough to work on um, almost all of them. Uh, I came on right at the tail end of the HTML, CSS, JavaScript site that they first launched with. Uh, that was more of just a marketing site to get, to, get the, to get the brand and the name and the product out to the world. Quickly after we launched that site, we realized, hey, you know what? Drupal makes a lot of sense here because a lot of the features and functionality that they need, Drupal 7 will, take, will cover. So we quickly migrated them to a Drupal 7 multi-site. So we'll get into the complexities of that in a little bit. Uh, but then I say two and a half because a couple of years ago, we actually reskinned that Drupal 7 site to give it a, a design refresh and add a few new features. So up until this point, they're on Drupal 7. And let's pause here for a second and talk about some of the problems that we, that we ran into with that, that approach. Now, I'm not saying multi-site's wrong or bad. There are use cases for it. So if you're going to come out of this thinking like, oh, we're ditching our multi-site because John said it's bad. Not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there are, there are use cases for it. This use case, in my opinion, at this point, um, for us, it was questionable, but we learned a lot from it, and that informed our decision going forward. So first thing, we were using a Drupal multi-site, which at this point, standing where I'm standing now, I view uh, as, as a problem, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Back then when I was building it, it was the way to go. Admin logins. So the admins had to log into eight plus different sites to manage content to do their kind of daily admin tasks on the site. Uh, now we could, have, we could have resolved this with a single sign-on solution. That was just another layer that we would have had to add on top of, of this solution. We had to translate eight sites. So again, Drupal multi-site, you got separate databases. We had to translate the eight sites into eight different languages, adds complexity, right? Luckily, we're using Lingotech, so that saved us a little bit on having to physically actually retranslate everything, but you still had to go through the process of sending the content up to Lingotech and bringing it back down. There's still, still a process there that takes the time. And then the last thing is, <coughs> Products, content, as I said, had to be updated on eight different sites. So like, hey, oh, we just uh, added this one, one feature to this product. We have to update the marketing material. Okay, well, some, some employee or intern is going to go through, update it on the U.S. site, update it on the Canada site, update it on this site and that site. It's just super time consuming. 
the site did have a shared theme, so there was some savings there. Hey, we need to make a theme update, change this red to blue. Okay, well, that's easy. We're gonna do that once and it's going to apply everywhere. But when it came to updates, again, multi-site, awesome, single code base, great. We make the update in one place, awesome, push it out to the server, awesome. Oh, we need to clear cache and run a DB update. All right, well, Drush helps you out with that. You can write a Drush command that'll do all of them, all the sites at once, update all the databases, clear all the caches. But then you have to go check every site and make sure, hey, like, okay, this one still works, this one still works, this one still works. All right, we're looking good. So that was super time consuming as well, added a level of complexity. The uh, last thing was scalability. So I just said that we were thinking we were, we were thinking we're going to launch a handful of sites uh, by the end of this year. Well, with Drupal 7, the process to clone a site or reproduce a site is copy the database, set up the new site in your sites file in, within the Drupal multi-site, and then remove the content you don't need, add the content you do need, remove the products you don't need, add the products you do need. You're starting to see it's not like, hey, we could get this site up in a week. It's like, hey, we get this site up in like two or three weeks. So scalability is a little bit of an issue. So let's fast forward to today, to right now, or as I say, someday in the future. This is the new Drupal 8 like a geosystem site. Now, everybody in this room is very special because this site has not launched yet. So you're seeing something that does not exist on the internet right now. Um, it will be, as that note says, coming to a browser near you uh, by the end of August. So let's get into the solution, right? We moved, we're building this brand new Drupal 8 site I, I, I don't think I've buried the lead. Clearly, we're not using multi-site architecture in Drupal 8, right? Um, we're using domain. So let's talk about the solution and how, how we architected that. First off, I'd like to start with Drupal 8. You get a bunch, a bunch of stuff right out of core that is super helpful in, in this endeavor. So first thing is configuration management, right? So with the Drupal 7 site, we weren't using features. So if we did something, we uh, in, uh, added a new feature, we added it locally, made sure it worked, added it to development, had the client approve it, added it to production. So like, there's some duplication of effort there, right? That guy's laughing because he knows, he's like, man, I've been there, it sucked. Um, so configuration management in Drupal 8, awesome. It's a great time savings. The next thing is a better caching system. Drupal 8 added cache tags. Cache tags are awesome. I don't have to say, hey, I'm gonna nuke the whole cache for all of the site. I can say, hey, I'm gonna nuke the cache for this page. Done. And the rest of the site keeps moving on just the way it should. Better caching system, awesome. Well, again, no lie, this site has translation. It has a lot of translation. So a better tra a better translation system came into Drupal 8, and I will tell you, it is awesome. If you guys have Drupal 7 sites that are being translated, move to Drupal 8, it'll make your life a ton easier. Just the advent of not having to go through each content type and select each field you want to translate, they've unified that screen. It's all on one screen now in Drupal 8. It saves you a bunch of time. It's great. And then the last thing is a better upgrade path to Drupal 9. So they were on Drupal 7. If they decided, eh, we're not gonna do Drupal 8, we would have had to go through the same process for Drupal 9. Uh, for Drupal 9. Now, we're on Drupal 8, we're actually on 8.7. So our upgrade path to 9 is going to be that much easier. Which the client's thrilled about. They're like, we don't have to like rebuild our site when Drupal 9 comes out, sweet. All right, let's get into the nuts and bolts a little bit. So this is a list of uh, all of the modules that we're using on the site. I actually, somebody was asked me a question yesterday and I counted how many modules we're using. We're using right around 90 modules on the site and uh, 50, uh, tw out of 25 of those modules, uh, there are 50 patches. So there are a lot, quite a few patches, quite a few modules. It's, it's a pretty big site. 
Um, what you'll notice here are these are only contributed modules. So there are some custom modules that we built that are um, working in there as well. So for this talk, we're actually only going to cover a subset of those modules. And they're the ones that um, kind of help this, this topic, right? Um, we have a bunch of other modules that do a bunch of other things. We aren't, we aren't going to focus on those. So let's start going through these. First things first, we're going to talk about the domain module or domain access. Uh, on our podcast, I have this debate with uh, my co-host Nick Laughlin all the time because I call it domain and he's like, well, you mean domain access, right? The title on the Drupal.org page says domain access, but the slug for the module is domain, so you pick which one you want. So out of the box with domain, we get a bunch of features. We have the ability to support multiple domains, which is great for Leica because that's exactly what they want to be able to do. So essentially we have multiple sites in one Drupal installation. We'll talk about the things that that saves in a little bit. Example, single site for admins to log into. I can log into their Drupal 8 site and have access to every single one of their sites and say, okay, well, this content that I'm creating, that can go to uh, these three sites, but not this site. Uh, we can clear one cache. We can update one DB. We still have one code base. So we're, we're checking a lot of boxes on our list of, of ways we can improve uh, efficiency here. Third thing is content sharing. As I just said, we can go in and I can say, okay, this page is only for North America. So it's going to be on the US site, uh, the Canadian site, someday maybe the Mexico site. And then uh, this, is, uh, this content is for Europe. So these two pages, they look relatively the same, except they have a couple of different content sections. And I can decide which site those go into, which menus they show up in, which page, which views they show up in, so on and so forth. The other thing is content access. One thing that Leica wants to be able to do is they want to be able to get their representatives in country to be able to go in and edit their content whenever they want. Well, they have the ability to section that down and say, hey, listen, you only have access to content that pertains to your site. Uh-oh. Um, so you could you can say hey or you know what French folks you're going into you're going into your site you can edit your your pages don't worry about it we'll deal with the translation all that stuff but then they can't get back to content that's specifically for for the US or Canada or one of the other one of the other countries so that's a huge plus so now we're gonna delve into a pretty deep topic here we're using the domain module but Leica doesn't actually um, have uh, TLDs for their country sites. Here comes the country path module. So we'll show here. This is actually our staging URL, right? Um, it illustrates how Leica is handling their country and language um, paths. So as I said, Leica does not ha use country-specific TLDs. They use a directory structure to inform you which site you're on, which language you're in. With our multi-site, we had to do a lot of, uh, it's funny because this note is accurate, we had to update the HT access file and do some server tomfoolery, as I noted here, to make, make this work appropriately. Country Path solves that for us in, in a pretty big way. So what you're seeing right here is essentially the French regional site in English. If we were to add another slash fr dash fr to that, you would see the French regional site in French. So that's our path structure going forward. Slash region slash language. Country path is, is the way to go there. Definitely, uh, definitely helps out. There are a couple of patches that we had to apply to it, but other than that, it works great. So the next part of this is commerce. This is a commerce site. You can go buy things here. And Commerce 2X solved a lot of our problems when it came to managing stores, managing commerce on the new Drupal 8 site. So a little bit about Commerce 2X. 
It's a complete rewrite from the 1x version. Uh, that's what we were using on the Drupal 7 site. So 2x, complete rewrite. Uh, it's uh, more of an API uh, first approach, which is awesome. On this project, we actually got to work with uh, Centaro, formerly Commerce Guys, um, and they were a huge help. It was great to be able to work with those guys and um, ask questions, get answers, help them test a little bit of uh, the Commerce features that we were kind of running into issues with. So that was super awesome as well. So Commerce out of the box solves a lot of problems for us. One first biggest problem is multi-store support. One commerce install gives you the ability to have multiple stores. And for Leica, that is key. Here's why. The US store has US currency, has US shipping, has US payment methods, right? The French store does not. It has French currency, has French products, has a different set of products, we'll talk about that in a minute, and also has um, uh, different shipping methods and different payment methods. So having the ability to install commerce once and have that, oh, we have this store and that store and this other store, awesome. Product sharing. So I just said, you know, the US and the EU have different product sets, but the US and Canada share a lot of the same products. So we have the ability to say, okay, we're going to set this product up once and we're gonna put it in the US store, the Canadian store, uh, the Spanish store, whichever stores we want. Or the, the reverse, number three there, store specific products. I can say, hey, you know what? This product is only sold in the US, this product is only sold in Europe. Perfect. And then we come to the common, common commerce features, right? There are a ton of common, common features that are in commerce that all the stores can benefit from. A, sh a unified shopping cart, uh, coupons and promotions, and then payment gateways and payment methods. As I said, you have the ability to set conditions to say, hey, this payment method only shows up here, this payment method only shows up there. Um, you also have the ability to do the same for shipping options. So like has a pretty complex shipping um, uh, structure as well. Uh, and that's another common commerce feature. But how do we get this to work with domain? So we have our regional site and then we have commerce. One thing um, that we actually worked with commerce guys on was uh, patching the uh, commerce store module to work a little bit better with the domain module. So to explain a little bit about what this module does, it gives you the ability to set a, um, a URL for the store that you want activated when you access it. So in commerce, in order to, um, in order to say, hey, we want, we want this store to be active, you set a store ID. And typically, the way commerce wants you to do that is they want you to, they want you to build, build that out uh, as a custom module to figure out how you want to set that store ID. Well, what we did was we said, hey, you have this commerce store module. Could we, could we patch it, add a feature to it to be able to say, like, look at the list of available domains from the domain module and let me select one of them to, to, for this store. Uh, Matt over at, at Centauro said, yeah, we can do that. Give me a little bit of time. Here's a patch. We tested it out. And that's exactly what you see here. Basically, we go into our store in commerce. You can see this is clearly the UK store because it's in British pounds. I'm able to select from, a, from an autocomplete, hey, I want this to be active when you go to the U UK uh, region site. Bang, done. Worked great. Uh, we tested it for a couple of days. Everything seemed to work out. And now we've rolled it in and, and we're, we're off to the races. Next, we're going to talk about commerce price list module. So we got a lot of variables here. We have regions. We have uh, different stores. We have different products, right? The client needed a way to manage, uh, manage all that. They didn't want to have to go in and set price variations for each product in like all these different products, right? They have... Right now they have uh, probably 100 products, but they could balloon up to you know 500, depending on what um, product lines they bring into the store and what countries they go into. So the price list module gives you the ability to 
create price lists for each store based on variation. So you can, in, in one place, you can say, okay, here are my, all my variations, here are all my, um, here are all my uh, prices, here's the uh, currency that they're supposed to be in. And basically what we have here is we actually have one price list per store. So each store can have its own, own price list. Um, we actually worked, uh, again, with Commerce Guys to add some functionality here to be able to, um, where it says import prices, we wanted to be able to import a uh, CSV, which actually already had come in the module, but we wanted that CSV, instead of having to wipe out everything and re-add it, we wanted it to be able to go through and update prices for products as, as it went through. So we worked with those guys to add that feature into, um, into the module. And again, test it for a couple of days. That one actually might have been a full week. Um, and it worked great. Client loved it, did what they needed to do. And now it's, now it's uh, out there in the wild. So we're pretty excited about that. All right. So we're talking about multi-site. We're talking about domain, right? Well, who wins? And you guys, you guys can feel free to chime right in here, right? So for uh, ease of use for admins, what do you think? Domain, right? For content sharing, what are you guys thinking? Domain, right? I, I, I can't hear you guys. Uh, for content access, yeah, there we go. And I think you guys got it by now, right? Single site, right? Domain. So I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that you know, oh, well, you never have to use multi-site. There are instances where multi-site is very valuable for this one. And for a lot of them out there, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that, that it is. I'm sure that the domain is just gonna work just fine. With that, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you. Um, so, two-part question, for it's been very short. Um, will it work for a lot of sites? Because if it's a single database, you know, where is the upper limit for usability? And I'll go ahead and ask my, my second question as well, so you can follow it. Um, will it function with uh, different primary domains? So if you have, you know, uh, subdomain one dot something.com, subdomain two dot something.com, subdomain three dot something. Okay, so those are, those are both really good questions. So just in case the recording couldn't hear that, question one is um, how well is this gonna scale? Uh, question two is will it work for other uh, domains like uh, top level domains uh, or subdomains? Um, so question one, that was a huge question for me. And originally going into this, I was like, well, you know what? It's a single database. At some point, we're going to get to that point where it could be a problem. And I said, you know what? We're going to cross that bridge when we get through it. We are hosting on Acquia. We're going to work with Acquia. We'll figure it out. Um, fast forward to a couple months ago, I gave this talk at a Boston Drupal meetup. And that same question came up. So great question. Uh, and the, uh, somebody in the back row said, hey, uh, by the way, uh, we've tested this with like thousands of domains and it works just fine. So uh, I'm pretty confident that the scalability will be, um, will be good. Uh, the other option there is worst case, if we need to split this into two sites to make it more performant, we can do it. Um, and at least we're not logging into any sites. Uh, second question with uh, subdomains and uh, top-level domains. Uh, yeah, with the domain module, you have the ability to set up aliases, you have the ability to set up um, top-level domains. So you could have an instance where you say, okay, you know, my site's actually accessible by two domains, right? Uh, Site1.whatever.com and Site2.whatever.com. Right? You can set Site1 as the primary and then site two is the alias and when you uh when you access the site it'll it'll just work uh as it should um, you know, a, so do you see any use case uh, sure i mean I, I see there is a use case um for multi-sites uh but i think it's very much on a 
case-by-case basis. Um, one instance that um, you know I, I think of uh, is a good use case for multi-site is one where the sites are very different. They're not going to share content. They have different admins. So all of the issues with Leica that we were um, working to solve were like, hey, we don't want our admins to log into eight sites. Hey, we want to share content. Hey, we want to share product. If you're not doing that, yet you're managing a group of sites, yeah, a multi-site makes great sense because you're using one code base. You're, you, you, know, you can run your, your commands and your, your deploys, one code base, do your database updates, and do your, uh, your cache players to the sites, and you're, you're in really good shape. So yes, there is a place for multi-site, but um, in this instance, uh, it wasn't it. Uh, I think you had a question for me. So, and we'll get to you. The domain multiple domain is a multiple groups. So, how are we going to manage the users? Uh, you know, they will be separate based on the site they are they come from. Can we manage the group based on that multiple domain? So, for this project, um, for this project, there was no need to separate users like that. Uh, there's one admin team that's working on all of the sites. Uh, and then all of the customers are, uh, they, they're just getting lumped into one, one group. So um, we, didn't have the, we didn't have the need to separate users into groups like that. Um, but uh, there's a talk, I think, later today about the groups module. I would check that out because I'm sure that you could work um, that into your domain structure to say, hey, if you come in on this domain, you're part of this group. If you come in on this domain, you're part of that group. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. In Drupal 7, there are a lot of contributed monitors that, that do that. I don't think they made it to Drupal 8. Yeah, that's why I said the groups modules. I know that one's Drupal 8 ready. Yeah. Just talking, in general, sorry. talking in general about the transition from Drupal 7 to 8, is there some of the issues here? Uh, well, okay. So we didn't really have many issues because we basically did a full rebuild and the client took the time, took the opportunity to um, to update the con their content. So they just re-entered all the content. So um, this was very much a case where we were like, okay, what did we learn from Drupal 7? Oh, we learned these six things. Okay, we're going to make those way better in Drupal 8. And we just kind of like <coughs> jettisoned the Drupal 7 site off into, off into space. So, um, you know, and if we do a lot of migrations from seven to eight, so we you know tend to use a migration API in Drupal eight to build build scripts, migrate content, um, we migrate users. Uh, so you know we can we can talk about that kind of off offline um, a little bit more. But yeah, for this project, we didn't have the need to kind of pull anything from seven to eight. Uh, I will say. I guess there's a little bit of a caveat there. The biggest thing was some of the third-party services that we were using in 7 did come to 8, so we had to rebuild modules um, for Drupal 8 to interact with those, those services. So I guess there was one. Uh, coming back to you, I'm gonna hit, hit you, no, hit you I first. I was gonna say, I'm getting angry talking. We, we wrote the custom module for group and domain. There you go, that's your solution right there. Don't come talk to me, go talk to that guy. It's like it's in control. There you go. Awesome. Love it. All right. Uh, the uh, domain like uh, project page talks about like requiring DNS um, access or being able to configure your own DNS. Uh, I'm, I don't quite know what that means even from like the, the README, and I wonder because in my situation, we can configure Apache but don't have can't like. So we're in the same boat. I, we we don't have access to DNS. Matter of fact, it is a very long and arduous process for us to make any DNS changes that we want to make. Um, so I'm in that boat. I will say this isn't a diss. It's just a, it's just a common fact of Drupal. Documentation for domain is great. Could be better, but I mean that's that's anything. Um, with that said. Uh, the, what they're talking about there is because the domain module works off of the top-level domains, you have to have access to point that top-level domain at your Drupal site. That's, that's pretty much the basics of it. We have not had to have made any DNS changes to get things working. Uh, as I said, we're hosted on Acquia. Um, all of their, what, what we've done there for the, the staging and development environments is just added those URLs as aliases 
um, to our domain to the new tool. So we have our um, our top level paths with country path, and then we have aliases for our local, our stage, and our development environments. So I think what they're talking about there is they're just saying like, hey, if your domain is pointed at like some other server, this is never going to work for you. Make sense? I think, I think that might be a for Okay. Keep in mind, though, uh, just another note on that, our DNS is actually pointing at Cloudflare, and then Cloudflare is pointing at our server. So there's, our DNS isn't directly pointed at the server. Uh, I think I got everybody up there, you, and then you. Do you find when you're using the domain aliases for your different environments that if you assign content to a specific, your, like your, your primary domain, that when you went to your staging site, the links were generated to your main live site, or any so, issues along those lines? So. Uh, quick answer is no, um, because what's happening is it's not generating it's not generating full links based on your domain. The domain is really just saying, hey, what what top level domain or country path are you coming in on? Okay, this is going to set those access permissions for that content, um, and it works the same exact way when you swap out an alias. So in the previous example, uh, you know, site site one dot my site dot com, right? I set an alias as site1.mydevsite.com, it's going to work exactly the same. So we, we haven't run into any, uh, we haven't run into any um, access or link uh, permission issues um, with domain. I must be doing something wrong. Oh yeah, is it seven or eight? Eight. Eight, okay. Yeah, when I found it by signs, there was two different options when you're editing like the content node. Yep. You have domain access and Assignment. Domain has a couple of different sub modules right. that come with it. So I think when I sign domain access, when I sign to a specific domain, yeah. so I have like a my and a duck, duck, duck. Yeah. And when I sign it to one of those, I found one was on my staging site, just to generate a link to the live site. That, you know, the, I'm using aliases in you know, the same way you are. Interesting. Right? Yeah, we're not using, um, there's a domain source module that comes with it. We were not using Okay. We had that shut off. So that could be part of your problem because essentially what that module does is it, um, it basically allows you to set an economical source for that content. Right. And that's probably what you're really drawing all those links. Okay. So that might be your problem. Thanks. Our um, situation is currently we are using a different CMS system and have the similar the domain concept. But, but uh, currently we have the situation is because we have a shared component so whenever we need to do some maintenance in the primary dom uh, uh, website, we need a bring down. So, but we have to bring down all of the sub site. Mm -hmm. So for the Drupal, because we are going to migrate uh, transfer to uh, Drupal, Azure Drupal. Mm -hmm. So it will be the same. So if, if we uh, need to uh, do some maintenance in the primary site mm -hmm. and uh, to bring down. So also need to bring down the sub site. So the way that it works is it's using one database. Yeah. So essentially, for my local, like if I'm, if I'm going to make a change, no matter what site it's to, I'm going to make a change. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pull the database down, and then get that on my local, and then do a config import, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to start working. Yeah. So yeah, essentially, you are bringing all the sites with you. But keep in mind that uh, if you've architected your content correctly, one piece of content could apply to all of those sites. So it really depends on how you architect your content, how you architect your site. But yeah, essentially it's one database, so you are bringing the whole thing down. Uh, yeah. So we're using Workbench Access to sort of manage permissions between content with different users. Yep. How does that differ from using like the domain access? So uh, the domain access module is solely based on what the user, what domains the user has access to. So you're setting up your domains in your domain list, you know, domain one, domain two, domain three. And then when you create a piece of content, you're setting that, okay, this is available to domain one. So then in permissions, the user roles, you're saying, okay, this user has the ability to access domain one. So if that piece of content were on domain one, domain two, uh, they would still be able to access it, I believe, um, because they have the access to domain one. But if there was somebody that was like domain three, and they want to access it, they'd say they get access to my data because they don't have the ability to add it. Don't mean more than it works independently of that. I've never tried both of them together. Um, more access permission modules are not always the best thing. Yeah. So, tread lightly. 
Any other questions? So primarily on the admin side of things that you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? No? You guys have been awesome. If you're interested, there are some books and some bottle openers down here. Uh, feel free to take something with it. Have a great day.